Hello, community. Today we look inside the black box that is called an AI system. So if we want to see inside the thought process of an AI system, when it is tackling complex question, we have now some new research that help us here to have insight and maybe find new training methods for existing AI, making those AI systems more capable for complex reasoning. And a simple use case that you have in your environment is, for example, a virtual assistant in your car at home who needs to understand and process our queries much more intelligently and give us more intelligent answers. So let's have a look at this. Now, of course, you can look at my channel and have a beautiful video sequence here of complex multi-step AI reasoning or superhuman rack system or a chantic AI system or we utilize here large generative graph model or we do some programming with automatic differentiation via text and text grad and self-improving machine learning system via DSPy. But no, today, today we relax, we enjoy the day and we have a look at a very beautiful simple and elegant research. It is from our colleagues here in Korea, KAIST, and they investigate how LLMs leverage their internal knowledge to perform complex reasoning. So, we focus today on understand how LLMs process and answer complex questions. And the approach is simple. We break down complex questions into more simpler parts, then we use here a graph representation, like a mind map, where each point or each node represents a simpler part of the complex question, so we do have a hierarchical structure, and then we can apply some mathematics and get an insight how an LLM leverages here its internal knowledge. And here you have the final results. Sometimes those LLMs are better at answering the simpler parts of a problem, but struggle with the whole complex question. This is known as a forward discrepancy. And other times, our LLMs can handle the whole complex question real well, but those LLMs struggle when dealing with its individual, with its simpler components in isolation. We call this a backward discrepancy. And Understanding why those discrepancies happen will open up new insights how we can have here a guiding process for the AI through specific questions in a very structured way to improve here the ability of our LLMs to answer more complex questions more accurately. How can we guide our LLM? Now, before we can answer this, we have to understand what was the research performed. Now, they started simple. They said, hey, we want to have three complexity layers. And we want to reason across different depth levels. So at first, we have D1, the concept knowledge. For example, what does the gradient of a function represent? The simple part. Then D2 is our procedural knowledge. Like, say, how do the gradients of activation function affect the speed of neural network training? And then we have a high level, our D3, our strategic knowledge. Why does ReLU training take less time than a sigmoid or a tangent superpolicus training? So, three simple complexity levels. Or you can call them D1, the recall of information, D2, the application of its knowledge, and D3, we bring it all together in some complex strategic thinking. You see, simple. Now, easy example for you, let's say we have here this question, a D3 question for our AI. Does a matrix always have a basis of eigenvectors? Now, for you, how would you deconstruct these questions into a set of simpler questions, and you decide how many D2s and how many D1s you would need. Give it a go. I'll give you a second to come to a conclusion. You got it. Beautiful. So they found, for example, those are the complexity levels they have to tackle before an LLM does really understand what D3 means. So we have four levels of D2, and then we have, for example, for this particular D2, for D1 structures. Now, this is interesting, huh? but now we say, okay, so we have to build this data, but how can we build this data? 
Let's be a little bit more specific. So what we need to do, we need to run here, if you look at, at the most complex level, an evaluation data set. So we need to build this data set. It must be new, it should be advanced, multi-level, multi-step reasoning sequences that on different LLMs to test now their reasoning performance and detect at what complexity levels our LLMs fail. So now our task is much clearer. So you see, from a D3 to a D2 explanation, beautiful. Now, the complexity, of course, is interwoven. Let's have a look at only the D1 level. You could have multiple D1s, let's say here, what is the definition of a square matrix, to what is meant by the eigenvalues of a matrix. Why are those two here in this context important to understand, and why should the LLM be able to answer this and identify this as significant knowledge pieces the LLM has to be able to reproduce its pattern? Or, let's make it another step, if you go now here cross complexity level, you say here the D1 domain, what is meant by the eigenvalues of a matrix? Is the LLM able to understand that this has a direct connex to the D2 level question? What is the process of finding the eigenvalues of a matrix? So you see we have here in level topics and we have here if we go here from simpler to more complex if we step up in the complexity does the llm really understand here the connex between different questions interesting no now but where do we get the data and there's another study very helpful and this study was done by princeton princeton university here february 16 2024 and they had a look at language model as science tutors. A very beautiful study, but we just need their database, their data that they created. So they invented something like here, a tutor evaluation, and this is a diverse question answering benchmark consisting of questions about long chapters from STEM textbooks. And of course, those question and answering were written by human experts. And this tutor eval helps measure now the real-life usability of LLMs as scientific assistants. And it is the first benchmark combining yet this long context, free-form generation, and multidisciplinary scientific logical knowledge sets together. So here we have now a beautiful data set. And... If you see how this data set was generated, this was quite complex and it involved a lot of human work. Look here at the grading template that they used at Princeton University. And just here for the first uh, paragraph, I have it here for you that you can read it better. It said, hey, your task is to evaluate the teaching abilities of a new AI system, whatever the LLM is. And this AI system is now interacting with a student about a science topic. So you will see that the student and the AI system are working together on a textbook chapter. And I would like you to rate now how well the AI system addresses the student questions. And this is just the first paragraph. So all the humans looked at this, looked at here the interaction here in the textbooks, or maybe this was generated by GPT-4 system synthetically, and they had to rate this. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of human work involved in this. And it is not that synthetic data work by themselves. In no way. Now, give you an example that you have an idea of what we are talking here, the level of complexity. Here we have a GPT-4 generated dialogue. The following dialogue was generated here at GPT-4. And GPT-4 was presented with the following textbook chapter from a particular textbook. There are 100,000 textbooks on I don't know, mathematics on the internet, and it was prompted to write a teacher-student dialogue, simulating now a class interaction about this particular textbook chapter. So GPT-4 had, I don't know, five or 10 or 100 textbook chapter on matrix diagonalization, and then they simulated synthetically here a dialogue, a question and answer system. So you have it here. Assistant says, hey, today we're going to discuss the concept of diagonalization of matrices. 
And the user says, hey, I'm not sure how to find eigenvalues. And the system says, no problem, you know. And explains eigenvalues. And the user says, hey, I think so. So I subtract here lambda from the diagonal entries. And here the assistant says, yeah, that's correct. And now, next step. And the user says, ah, oh, now I have to do this. And the assistant says, yeah, but be careful because... So you see, the complete human learning process that you would as a human have with your teacher now is now a generated synthetically by GPT-4 from the textbooks, examples. And now we have here this interaction that is now here with this grading template rated and the best way of teaching here or having a discussion between a student and the machine or the student and its teacher is now rated by human experts how the AI system addresses here the student's question in the best possible way. So what is the best possible way for the student to learn a complex topic? And this data set, this insight, this, this question or answer pairs, this is here now the base for this. But you know, this is now the second video because in my last video, when I was talking here, the new methodology by OpenAI here, by reinforcement learning by human feedback and this new beam search methodology, I showed you this particular image here. And OpenAI told us here, we are now training AI models that help human to evaluate other AI models. And you remember I told you, we have, so we have here our GPT-4 system produces something, and now to optimize this GPT-4, it is now criticized here but a human expert. But OpenAI now goes a step further. And while this human expert is doing his job at evaluating GPT-4, there's another GPT-4 system that looks now over the human shoulder and learns how a human is evaluating a machine. And this GPT-4 now is tasked here with a pattern recognition. What does a human do to improve the machine so that in the long term you understand we can get rid of the middleman. Beautiful. This was OpenAI, but we are now back here to our very simple, very beautiful, elegant uh, research. And the researchers here from Korea said here, we introduce now here a depth question and answer data set. It's a collection of deconstructed questions, and I'll show you how they deconstruct the D3 and answers derived from a human-written scientific D3 question in this tutor evaluation data set. So they take here the data from the other group and now they optimize it for their specific tasks. And they say our focus is of course the most complex, the D3 question as the target complex question, examining the utilization of multiple layers of knowledge and reasoning in the sequence that goes from a D1, a D2, and to a D3. And here you have the GitHub, you have the code, you have the data. Have a look at this. It is really nice and it deserves more than just two stars. Having now the data set, we have to look for open source model. And they decided to go for Llama 2 as an old Llama, Llama 3 as the current Llama, and a Mistral and a Mixtral mixture of expert system. And they had varying sizes from 7B to 70 billion free trainable parameters of those LLMs. So those were the models. Now we have the data, we have the models. The goal is defined to examine the importance of structured intermediate steps, the guidance, how can we guide an LLM in the reasoning process, and what is the best way to guide an LLM, a little old grandfather, a Lama 2 model, how can we improve the performance also for models that are not that performant at all. Now, as I told you, they developed here a novel graph-based hierarchical representation that delineates here the dependency between different layers of the knowledge. And as I told you, the node are the questions and the edges in this graph are now the reasoning process with different complexity crossing edges. Based on the graph definition, we construct a data set that encompasses a diverse concept and reasoning types. Reasoning types I have not yet introduced to you. Give me a minute and you will understand this is also simple. So you see D1, D2, D3. So we have here basic knowledge as I showed you. Then we have a more complex layer here in the D2. And then it all comes together to solve here the question that is a D3 question. So this is from the simplest to the most complex direction. That is beautiful. 
Now, remember you want D2 and D3 for my little grasshoppers, recall of information, D2 is the selection of appropriate procedures, and D3 is emphasizing why the knowledge is applicable. Great. Now let you give me an example of this study that you have a feeling what is going on here. So you have a D2 question and you want to find all the necessary D1 question here that will lead to be able to solve the D2 question. So let's go. How do neutrinos differ from other subatomic particles and why are they considered potential candidates for dark matter? In order to answer this, the LLM has to know, quotation marks, in its pattern it has learned what are neutrinos at D1, what are subatomic particles, D1, what is dark matter, D1, what characteristic do particles need to be co considered candidates for dark matter. Maybe this is already a, a, another D2, but never mind. So you see, those are the questions necessary. The LLM has to bring up a, at least some primary ideas before we can tackle here a D2 reasoning and an explanation. Now, explanation, you find that the reasoning type can be quite different. For example, this here is a comparative. You can compare two or more concepts and identify similarity or differences between neutrinos and other subatomic particles. Or another question, eco-efficient urban planning can address the challenges of rapid urbanization in developing countries. You have now a relational reasoning type. You specify and explain the relationship between different concepts and how they are connected organically. Then you have causal relationship, inductive relationship, criteria development. So they did a lot of work and this is some beautiful data set that I will also use in my work. Plus here the evaluated data set here from Princeton University on science. Now they found that they have to impose here three criteria on this graph so that the system works. So the first is criteria is comprehensiveness, implicitness, and non-binary question. Easy explanation, non-binary. Do you know the answer just in yes or no, but give me some text output. Great. So what do we have now? We have now all this beautiful textbook, mathematics, physics, real world question from the Princeton University tutorial evaluation data set. And now we take those where we have here the complexity D3 question and we know all the other question from the textbook and how is the solution path forward. And they decided here to go from the tutor evaluation data set with 91 D3 question. And you see math, computer science here, distribution and everything. Great. And then they started here to deconstruct this question. Remember, they had a complete solution as presented in the mathematical textbooks already. So now the question was, how do we do this? So they say, for the deconstruction phase, so for each dk question, k equals 3, so for each d3 question, we generate up to 4 dk-1, d2 question using GPT-4 Turbo. And now we see again, now we're using not human intelligence, but we go now with some synthetic intelligence. So they tried to use here the best available AI system, GPT-4 Turbo at the time. And they generated here synthetic reasoning data, which might not be the best, but at least they had some ground to truth from the textbooks. And they made sure that they have no double entry, so they further specified, hey, we util utilize a sentence transformer, as per yippee, the embedding model to identify and eliminate new duplicate questions to recose and similarity of their embeddings, of their vector representation in the embedded space. So you see, beautiful done. So they have it, they deconstruct it to the simpler questions, knowing now everything. And then, they, as I told you, we have different types of reasoning needed to progress here from basic to a more complex knowledge level. And they used here a sample of 20 D3 questions, and they interconnected 80 D2 and 320 D1 question. And as I've showed you at the depth 3, we have comparative, causal, inductive, criteria development at 
Level two, we have relational, procedural, application, and so on. And they analyzed this, and it was a real nice study. Have a look at this if you want to know this. But of course, they had now clear question. And they put forward now this forward discrepancy that I described to you in words, now with a mathematical formula. So remember, forward discrepancy quantifies the decline in performance as the question increase in its complexity within a structured reasoning hierarchy. And this is, in our example, a graph structure. So essentially, this measures here the highlights how well the models perform on basic tasks relative to more challenging one that would require some advanced reasoning. Of course, there's the other way back. We call this a backward discrepancy, measures inconsistencies where LLM can answer a complex question, and these three, for example, correctly, but struggle with simpler subcomponents of this question, D2 or D1. So this particular metric parameter is now crucial, critical in understanding models that may appear to perform well on the surface, so somehow it can find the right solution to a D3, but it lacks a deeper understanding of the underlying principle because the solution to the D3, it just learned the solution by memorization. But it does not understand why this is the correct result. And with this hierarchical structure that is now probed here for this particular complexity levels in, and their interwoven patterns, they have now mathematical, let's call it, factors to evaluate this. So those two indicators help us now understand not just whether a model can solve a problem, but how it approaches here the problem solving at our three different levels of complexity. And those three levels are just the simplest case of three levels, high, medium, low. And if they measure now both the forward and the backward discrepancies, they can better understand here a model's depth of understanding and the ability of our LLM to generalize across different tasks. And if you say how it is calculated, well, you're not going to believe it. There is a specific function of a question for the factual correctness, but this is, of course, also measured by an LLM. <laughs> so we have, again, some synthetic data set and some synthetic understanding, but never mind, somewhere we have to accept that here the LLMs are evaluating other LLMs with cross-LLM evaluation. But of course, it would be much nicer if you would put here a professional human in the loop who really understands here from a human perspective here the interconnect between the complexity levels. But never mind, we do it with an LLM evaluator for this function f. Great. Now, let me give you an example from a green grasshoppers. We do the same again. I explained forward discrepancy and backward discrepancy in a simple model. So let's say the LLM performs well on the basic and intermediate tasks, such as computing 7 times 5. This is a D1 task. And calculating the area of a rectangle, give me its length and its width. This is a D2 task. However, as the LLM struggles with the complex question about Deducing the length of one side of a rectangle, given the area of the rectangle and the length of another side of this rectangle, this is now a D3 complexity. And if the LLM struggles here, you understand, we have here forward discrepancy is observed because the model performs well on simpler subproblems, the A1, D2, but fails when the complexity increases to D3, requiring a synthesis of concepts. And this discrepancy points to a gap in the model's ability to apply combined knowledge to solve more advanced problems. This is nice. But remember, this formula is just one of many formulas you can invent. This is just one particular perspective. Go and invent your own formula for your tasks. Or if you have now backward discrepancy, and this is exactly where the model can handle complex tasks, can solve the D3, but shows unexpected difficulty with simpler related tasks. And this suggests, and now this is the explanation, that while the model might be able to deduce or memorize answers to complex problems, this model might not have a robust understanding at all of the intermediate concepts involved, 
such as the direct computation of an error for given dimension of this rectangle. So you see, with these two probing parameters, the forward discrepancy and the backward discrepancy, we get a feeling, it's not perfect, but it gives us a feeling how good models are at this. And here you have the result of the study. So you had a LAMA 2, then a LAMA 3, 8B instruct, 70B instruct, a Mistral and a Mixtral, and then you have an old GPD 3.5 Turbo as a comparison. And there you have your forward discrepancy and your backward discrepancy. And then we have it here from the level, complexity level D2 to D3 and backwards, and from D1 to D2 and the overall performance. Now, does not surprise at the time this study was done, the LAMA 370B, as you can see here in bold, was the best performing model, yes, all over the place. So just let me be clear in this insight. To determine whether the solving complex question requires reasoning rather than memorization of the LLM or the training data, we use here pre-training data detection method to approximate your potential aspect of the memorization, and they show that while shallow question, simple question D1, can be addressed through memorization, solving deeper question requires more than just recalling a single piece of memorized knowledge, indicating here clearly a need for some significant improved reasoning capabilities, and this is exactly what we expect. Beautiful. Let me give you more examples. So, here we have now reasoning type example, reasoning type quantitative, and reasoning type application. Here you have, for example, let's go with a D3 level question. How can I evaluate, you ask your LM, the, the suitability of the ideal gas equation for a given gas? So D2, how do you calculate the property, such as pressure, temperature, and volume using here the gas law? What methods can be used to obtain experimental data for the properties? So you see, all those examples are here in the training, are here to test, to probe the LLM, so that we are able to understand what are the strong points of this particular LLM, let's say a LAMA 3, on what day that has been trained, on what pattern it has been trained, and what it is able to reproduce. Beautiful. Now, we were also talking how to guide now, after we know all of this, how to guide now our LLMs for a better reasoning process. Let's focus on this now. So, studies on reasoning have shown that enforcing LLMs to explicit reason through intermediate steps, simplest you know, is step by step, improve the reasoning abilities. And the researcher here in this study investigated whether explicitly providing these reasoning processes to the model, let's say in a few shot example, can aid in solving complex questions. And they did here an experiment with three different ways, with three different solutions to provide here the reasoning process to the LLM. At first, they have a multi-turn. A multi-turn conversation, like I showed you, we have a student and an assistant, and they are talking about here the diagonalization of a matrix. Then we have the perfect prompt, the golden solution of a prompt, and their gold answer are provided here in the prompt. And then we have, not the direct answer, but a prediction, where the model prediction, let's say of a GPT-4, are given in the prompts. And now the question is, what of these three is the best one? What is the best way to proceed to improve the reasoning capabilities? I'll give you the result. They come to the conclusion with smaller models, a 7B model, they tend to perform better in the reasoning process if you just give them the gold answer. While more bigger models, more capable models, favor here the self-predict results. An explanation the authors give us here, this preference here of B may stem from the alignment of the self-generated inputs with the model's internal reasoning when they are already proficient. But then, you remember, we had also the multi-turn approach. And now multi-turn is interesting because it has some benefits. So for the, the multi-turn approach now provides the most stable results across all depths, enhancing the performance of smaller models. 
and you would say, great, but it only causes minimal performance drops for larger models. So larger models do not like multi-turn approaches in, in a particular way. But if you provide them, okay, their performance, the original performance drops off just a little bit, a minimal way. So be careful. If you have now a smaller LLM, 7 billion, stable results with multi-turn approach or gold answer do not really go with self-predict results but if you have more capable models like 70b or 400b they like you to self-predict and do maybe be careful with the multi-turn approach if you use this here in the reasoning process that you show your huge llm because this may cause here performance drops here for those larger llms so, some really interesting insight how to optimize your reasoning process here without fine-tuning, without doing any further complex investigation. Have a look at your graph, have a look at the data set by Princeton University. I definitely will use this approach for my particular LLMs that I fine-tune and I pre-train now because I have now a better understanding how to improve uh, let's say, on a non-complicated basis here, the reasoning process of those models. And also, if you look here, especially in the science area, all those questions from the human textbook that were collected by Princeton University, they are really a gold mine also for as a data set for the fine-tuning of your LLM, if you are into science, mathematics, physics, chemistry, whatever you like. And this is it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was a little bit interesting. I hope you found some new ideas in this. And it would be great to see you in my next video.